Hello, so welcome back. So last time we discussed about that soap film problem and we saw how this gives rise to a huge linear system where the coefficient matrix consists of lots of zeros and only a few non-zero entries. And we also mentioned why Gauss-Jordan elimination is not a very suitable technique for such systems. Then I mentioned there is something called iterative solution of linear equations that is more suitable in such a situation. Now we are going to look at one such thing. And let's start with an example. So let us explain this method using this system of equation. It's a three equation system with three unknowns. So what do we do? To solve it in our iterative way is to look at the x term in the first equation, the y term in the second equation and the z term in the third equation. Then we take this on the other side. So take this on one side, take this on the other one side and this on one side. So I write it in this way 10x, take those on that side. 14 plus y minus z. Take this, keep this minus 20 here. Put everything else on other side. Minus 3 minus 2x minus 5z. Keep 29z here. 29z. 2 minus 3x minus 16y. Now I divide this entire equation by this 10. So I get x equal to 14 by 10 plus y by 10 minus z by 10. Here similarly I write y equal to minus 1 by 20 then minus 3 minus 2x minus 5z. And finally, z is equal to 1 by 29, 2 minus 3x minus 16y. So this original set of equations and these derived set of equations, they are the same thing. Any solution here will be a solution there and vice versa. But the way I have written it is in the form of a fixed point iteration. Now, how we use this system to carry out the iteration, there you have different choices. So, let us show the simplest of them. The simplest technique will go like this. You start with sum x0, y0, z0. You start with some initial guess x0, y0, z0. You plug them in this right hand side to get x1, y1, z1. So you write x1 equal to 1 over 10, 14 plus y0 minus z0. So the right hand side will always have the zero things. y1 will be minus 1 over 20, minus 3, minus 2x0 minus 5z0 and similarly z1 will be 1 over 29, 2 minus 3x0 minus 16y0. So you get x1, y1, z1 and you go back. Keep on doing this. So I can write this as xn, yn, zn. And these will be n minus 1, 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 n minus 1. Keep on repeating this until you get convergence. No guarantee in general that this will converge. So you will possibly carry it out for 50 steps. If you get convergence within that, fine, you stop. If not, you say that this method fails in this case. This technique is called Kaus. Jacobi method. 
Gauss Jacobi method and it's the simplest iterative scheme. So you understand that in the right hand side I am always plugging the old values and hence doing the computations. You might think of it as a diagram like this x0, y0, z0. When you compute x1 you are using x0 uh, you are not using x0, you are using the other two, y0 and z0. When you are computing y1, you are using x0 and z0. When you are computing z1, you are using x0 and y0. And again, when you compute x2, you use these two and you go on like this. So that is one way of solving a linear system iteratively. Now there are other methods also and we are going to look at them soon but first let us see how we implement this technique in a computer. So we have to start with a set of vectors which I call old x, old y, old z set of numbers or vectors and we will get the new values which I will call new x, new y and new z. So I will write new x is equal to 1 over 10 that is 0.1 times I had 14 plus old y minus old z. Oops, there should be any space here. Similarly, new y will be minus 1 by 20 times minus 3 minus 2 point old x minus 5 old z. Times old z and new z will be 1 over 29 times 2 minus 3 times old x minus 16 times old y. So these are my iterations, <coughs> and I will start with some value of old x, old y. I have no idea what I should start with. Suppose I start with all of them equal to 0, so old x equal to 0, old y equal to 0, old z equal to 0. And then I will just keep on running this again and again. <coughs> so every time I finish computing the new x, new y and new z, I will like to store them back into old x, old y. So I will say old x equal to new x old y equal to new y and old z equal to new z and it will be a good idea to print these values at every step so i will print it right here so i will say cat old x so i will write x equal to old x y equal to y equal to old y and z equal to old z. <coughs> so at the start of every iteration I will write down the current values then I will compute the new values and store them back in the old and I will do it how many times I do not know suppose I do it i from 1 to 10. So I put the entire thing inside a loop. <coughs> so let's see what I get. Oops, I get an error message. I forgot a comma here. That's why I got an error message. No, I forgot to put a new line. I put a new line so that it goes to the new line. And here I have the values. So I see these are my x's and they are pretty well, converging, they are really converging, yes. They have not yet completely converged, so I will um, increase the number of steps from 10 to 20. And yes, they have converged very nicely. I can see that they have really converged. So that was the implementation of Gauss Jacobi method using R. Now it is possible to improve upon this technique by a very simple common sense trick 
and that will give rise to the next method which we shall discuss now. In the Gauss-Jacobi method, we always used the n minus 1 terms in the right hand side and got the nth terms here. So here there is no nth term y n minus 1, z n minus 1, x n minus 1 and so on. If instead we use the most recently available term at every step, we get what is called the gauss seidel method. So here the scheme will be like this. I start with x0, y0 and z0. When I compute x1, I use y0 and z0, just as in gauss jacobi method. But when I compute y1, the most recent value of x is x1, so I use this x1. And the most recent value of z so far is still z0, so I use this. When I compute z1, I need to use x and y. I have x1 and y1 as the most recent values, so I use them. Then again, when I compute x2, I use the most recent values of y and z, so I again compute x2 based on y1 and z1, just like the Gauss-Jacobi method. But when I want to compute y2, I use x2 and z1. When I compute z2, I use y2 and x2. So the equations remain essentially same as before except that here y n minus 1 n minus 1 remains. When I am computing y n, I will be using x n and not x n minus 1. Here still z n minus 1 because z n is not yet prepared. When I compute Zn, I will be using the most recent value of x, that is xn, and most recent value of y, that is yn. This will be the Gauss-Seidel method. The Gauss-Jacobi method was pretty easy to implement. Now yet we'll, we shall see that the Gauss-Seidel method is even more easy to implement. As before, we shall use the language R. Now we are going to see the Gauss-Seidel method used on the very same thing. So here I do not need to distinguish between old x and new x. So, so essentially what I can do is that when I am computing new x, I do not have new y and new z available because that's the thing that I am computing first but when I am computing new y I do have new x so I will just go into new x but z is still old z when I am computing new z I do have new x as well as new y available so I will change both of them new x and new y and so I compute new x, new y and new z and there is no need for this final line old x equal to new x because I am not going to use any values. Oh yeah, I do have to do that. So old x equal to new x, old y equal to new y and old z equal to new z. Now <coughs> let's just try it out. So well, here also I, have, I get good convergence. So let's try with 10 steps. So let's see how many steps I need to convert. So I will just try 10 steps maybe. So here you see within 10 steps I convert quite well. So in the Gauss Jacobi method 10 steps were not enough. But here you see I have converged here itself. Even from this line onwards or maybe I should go to this line. This line onwards I have converged. So this method converges faster. Though there is no theorem to that tune, it is not true that for every case Gauss Seidel will converge faster, but it generally does, usually does, and that is natural because I am always using the most recent values. Now the way we wrote the code may be improved. In fact, we really do not need to distinguish between old x and old z, etc. So what I will do is that I will replace all these terms old and new. So I will just replace this old 
and I will get rid of old. I do not need any term old and I do not need new also. So the last line which is x equal to x, y equal to y is not needed at all. You always use whatever value is available. So whenever you compute x, you just overwrite the old value of x because you are never going to need old x anymore. You just need the most recent values. So that keeps the code much simpler. So let's just run it. Of course, it gives the same answer. It's the same code basically. Make sure that you have understood whatever we have discussed so far. Now comes the difficult part of this class. If you want to take a little bit of rest, this is the right time. So you might like to take a little bit of rest while you keep the video paused. So what we are going to do now is to prove why these methods are going to work or whether they are going to work at all. Both these techniques are variations of some common idea. So we shall first discuss about them. So we will consider these two techniques as special cases of a common technique called splitting method. In both the Gauss-Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel method, we started with a linear system of equations where all the variables were on the left side and the constant vector was on the right hand side. Then we split it up into two parts. We took part of the x, y, z, part of the variables on the left hand side and kept part of the remaining x, y, x, y, z on the right hand side. So we split up the entire thing. How we split it up, depending on that, we have Gauss-Jacobi, Gauss-Seidel and we can have many other ways of doing it. Now all these techniques are a special case of a method called splitting technique. So we will learn about that and the various convergence criterion that we shall learn will all be generally applicable to any splitting method. So these are called splitting techniques or splitting method. Splitting methods. So the general splitting method goes like this. You will be required to solve Ax equal to B. A and B will be given. X is what you have to solve for. You will split A into two parts. Suppose I call them M and N. M minus N. So you will decide about M and N such that M will be a non-singular matrix and N will, be, N will be whatever you need. So every splitting method will give you one particular way of splitting it, splitting A as M minus N. Once you have this M minus N, this equation now becomes M minus N times X is equal to B. You take the NX on the other side. So you write mx, keep this on the left hand side, take that on the right hand side and write it as nx plus p. Now m being non-singular, that's how we split it. I can now write it as x equal to m inverse nx plus n inverse sorry, M inverse B. This equation and this equation are exactly the same equations. Any root here is a root here, any root here is a root there. But this is a way to write it in the fixed point form. <coughs> now if the vector xi is a true solution of this, then of course xi is also a true solution of this. So if the solution that we are trying to find, suppose this has got unique solution and a solution is the vector xi, then xi will also solve this equation. So it will also have this n xi plus m inverse p. Now the splitting method technique will do the following. It will use this to generate a fixed point iteration it will start with some initial guess for x and suppose it is x0 then by using this it will compute x1 on, x1 use that x1 here it will get x2 so in general it will use xn 
and it will get x n plus 1 starting from some initial x0 vector. Now both the Gauss Jacobi and the Gauss Seidel method are special cases of this for suitable choices of m and n. Now, now we are interested in knowing when this will converge, that the x tends will converge to j. So to, to see that you just subtract this from that and you will get xn plus 1 minus j which is the error at step n plus 1. This is the true value and this is your approximate iteration value is equal to subtracting m inverse n xn minus j. This just cancels off. Quite naturally you will call it en the amount of error in step n then this is amount of error in step n plus 1. So you get this relationship between, between en and en plus 1, how the error evolves and it is this result. So if the error at step n is this, then the, the error at step n plus 1 will be this. Naturally, we want en, this sequence, to go to 0. For this, we require m inverse n to be something like a contraction mapping. That is, it should somehow make en smaller. In that sense, en will be made smaller to produce en plus 1. So this will be smaller than that. In the next iteration, en plus 2 will be even smaller and eventually they will go down to 0. Now, what is meant by a matrix being a contraction map? And there are various ways of making it precise. We shall see one way. But before that, let me ask you a question. Do you really see why the Gauss-Jacobi and the Gauss-Seidel methods are both special cases of splitting methods? That is, if you choose your m and n suitably, you split your a suitably as m minus n, then you will get the Gauss-Jacobi method. And if you choose your m and n slightly differently, you will get Gauss-Seidel method. That's like a simple puzzle. To, so try to think about it. I will give you a hint. I will tell you the answer for Gauss-Jacobi method. What you have to do with this, here is your matrix A, a square matrix. Look at the diagonals. Extract them out. That is your M matrix. So M is a diagonal matrix with the diagonal entries taken from A. Whatever remains, that is all the diagonal entries and zeros in place of the diagonals, that essentially is your n. Basically, n is the negative of this matrix. So, m takes care of the diagonal entries and n takes care of the off-diagonal entries. At this point, you might like to pause the video a little and try to work out the case for Gauss side. That is also pretty easy. If you are confused, take a simple 3x3 three three example and work out the entire thing and you will see that the choice of the M and N are pretty similar to what we did for gauss jacob But in the meantime, we shall continue discussing the general splitting method convergence criteria. So we saw that we have such an equation En plus 1 is equal to m inverse n e n and I, we would like to have some property of this matrix which will say that it will reduce the size of e n it is something like a contraction map it, it will shrink this vector to produce that vector now how we make this idea precise it so happens that there is a necessary and sufficient condition on this matrix under which this en vectors will go to zero irrespective of whatever your initial error is. And that condition depends on a quantity called spectral radius. This is of great importance in mathematics, spectral radius. So it is the following. <coughs> 
that suppose you consider this matrix m inverse n which is the square matrix by the way so you take the square matrix it's a real square matrix this is defined even if you have a <coughs> complex square matrix in our case it's a real square matrix so it has got n eigenvalues so suppose m inverse n suppose it is of the order n by n this n by the way has nothing to do with that n so this is the order so it has got n eigenvalues call them lambda 1 to lambda n these are all complex numbers in general they are not necessarily all distinct so if i consider them in the plane this is possibly lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 lambda 4 maybe this is again lambda 5 lambda 6 and possibly this is lambda 7 so you have got n equal to 7 so I want to put this, so all these points together is commonly called the spectrum. When I say spectrum of a matrix, I mean the set of all eigenvalues of a matrix. This indeed has something to do with spectrum of physics, the spectrum that you can produce using a prism. But we are not going to go into those things. In mathematics, spectrum of a matrix means set of all eigenvalues, spectrum of a square matrix. So that's the spectrum. And the spectral radius is the radius of the smallest circle that will contain all these things. So you look at the farthest one from the origin. If you consider this circle, then this radius is called the spectral radius. In other words, it is basically maximum of lambda 1 modulus lambda n this is the modulus sign because we are working with complex numbers that is called the spectral radius commonly denoted by the letter rho so it will spectral radius of m inverse n is this now a necessary and sufficient condition that e n will converge to zero irrespective of what e naught you start with that condition is that spectral radius must be strictly less than 1. Clearly spectrum, spectral radius has to be greater than or equal to 0 because we are taking modulus. So that's the theorem. That E n will converge to 0 if and only if spectral radius is strictly less than 1. The proof of this is not at all trivial. If you are interested in looking up this proof or any other proof, you might consult this book, Golab and Van Loon. Not a very readable book, but it contains all the proofs. The name of the book is Matrix Computations. Kind of the Bible of these things, such topics, and it is about as easy to read as the Bible is. So we are going to use this fact. <clears throat> and then for different splitting methods we will try to see whether m inverse n has spectral radius less than 1 or not. So we shall now learn two methods which will both be of the same tune namely you give me a splitting method and a matrix A and if the matrix is good then that splitting method will have rho m inverse n strictly less than 1. A sufficient condition for the Gauss-Jacobi method to converge is called strict diagonal dominance. Strict diagonal dominance. Strict diagonal dominance is the condition where the diagonal is much larger than the off-diagonal element in a very precise sense, which is the following. I will take an example. So I will take suppose this is 20, this is minus 1 and this is 2 and this is minus 50, this is 1 and 40 and this is 100 and this is 90 and 2. I will say that this has strict diagonal dominance in the sense look at the diagonal entry. You see it is larger than the off diagonals but something much stronger is true. This absolute value of this must be more than 
total absolute value of all the other entries in that same row that is the absolute value of 20 is greater than absolute value of minus 1 plus absolute value of 2. Similarly here absolute value of this diagonal is greater than these two absolute values put together. Similarly here 100 is greater than 90 plus 2. Strict because I have a strict inequality here. So the definition is AII the diagonal entry I as diagonal entry absolute value of that is strictly greater than all the other things in the ith row but j not equal to i that gives you all the other off diagonal entries in row i it must hold and this must hold for all rows that is called strict diagonal dominance. So now we know, without any proof of course, a necessary and sufficient condition for a splitting method to convert to the correct answer. We have seen two examples of splitting methods, Gauss-Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel. For each of these cases, we shall now try to get one sufficient condition under which this necessary and sufficient condition should hold. So we will get one sufficient condition for the Gauss-Jacobi technique to convert and another sufficient condition for the Gauss-Seidel method to convert. Both these conditions must be very easy to check, not easier than checking the spectral radius directly. We start with the Gauss-Jacobi method. It is enough to show that the spectral radius of m inverse n is strictly less than 1 and in case of the Gauss-Jacobi method, m is nothing but the diagonal entries, the diagonal matrix and n is the remaining part. So if my matrix is something like say 20, 1, 2, 30, 5, 6, and 90 to 1, if that was my original A, then M consists of the diagonal part. So my M will be the diagonal matrix 20, 30, 90, and 0, 0, 0, 0, and N will be the remaining thing, negative of the remaining thing, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 2, 6, 5 to 1 minus of that because we have the condition A is equal to M minus N. So what is M inverse N? Let's work that out. <coughs> M inverse N is simply you M inverse is 1 over 20, 1 over 30, 1 over 90 and when you pre-multiply N with that this has the effect of dividing all the entries in the first row by 20. So that will be, let's keep the minus outside, it will be 0 by 20, so it remains 0, 1 over 20, 2 over 20, you will divide all these entries by 30, so 5 over 30, this 0 remains 0, and 6 over 30, and finally, here this 0 remains 0, you divide everything by 90, 1 by 90. Let's give it a name, I will call it C. So this matrix I call C, so for this example I call it C. Now C has this interesting property, <coughs> so I can write down the general form, whatever I did. The ijth entry of C, you can understand, is just Aij the ijth entry of the original matrix divided by a i i and because of the minus i should have this minus here this is when i is not equal to 0 and if you are in the diagonal then of course it is 0 if i is equal to 0 so we can see that if i add all the entries in the diagonal 
they must be strictly less than 1. That is precisely the condition of strict diagonal dominance because you are adding all the diagonal entries of diagonal entries and dividing it by the diagonal entry I mean all the absolute values so you can see that summation over j j is the column index of absolute cij must be strictly less than 1 because absolute 1 plus absolute 2 divided by absolute 20 strictly less than 1 that is precisely what we meant when I said that this has strict diagonal dominance. Absolute 20 is more than these two absolute things put together. So for all i, we have this condition. What I am going to actually show is, if this holds, then we must have rho of c strictly less than 1. So that is what I am actually going to prove. The proof is pretty simple. We just take any arbitrary eigenvalue of the matrix C and then show that its absolute value, its modulus, must be strictly less than 1. So let lambda be an eigenvalue of C. Lambda eigenvalue of C. So it has a corresponding eigenvector. So let V be a corresponding eigenvector. So we have, what do we have? Lambda V is equal to CV. That is the defining equation. Now V consists of some numbers. Everything is happening over complex numbers. So B is say V1 to Vn. These are the different components of the vector V. And these are complex numbers. So if I look at their absolute values, they are non-negative real numbers. So one of them has to be maximum. The same maximum may occur in multiple places, but you can find something which is maximum. So suppose I will say Vk is that maximum thing. This is the largest. So everything else is less than or equal to Vk. So I have for all i, this less than or equal to Vk. I call that my k. Now, in this equation, you consider the kth term. So, the kth component. This is a vector. That's a vector. Look at the kth component. Here, it is pretty straightforward. It is just lambda Vk. And here, it will be the kth row times entire V, so that will be C K J sum over J V J. What I will do is I will take absolute value. Taking absolute value, absolute value of lambda times absolute value of B K, these are all complex numbers in general, that is equal to absolute value of the sum, triangle inequality so, C, K, J times V, J. Now, remember all these V, Js, they are less than or equal to V, K. So, I am working with that maximum thing. So, this will be C, K, J, V, K. The sum being over J, you can bring this out of the sum. So, you will get, well, I can write equality here. Vk comes out J C K J. <clears throat> I know that all this sum must add up to 1. So I know, uh, sorry, it must add up to something strictly less than 1. So this must be strictly less than mod Vk. So I get this. Now naturally I want to just divide both sides by mod Vk. Can it be 0? It cannot be 0 because this is the maximum modulus and if that fellow happens to be 0, everything else must be 0. So the entire eigenvector must be a 0 vector. That cannot be because eigenvectors by definition are non-zero vectors. Because if you allow 0 vectors, then this will always be satisfied for any lambda. So these are always non-zero. So, Vk, absolute value of Vk must be non-zero, therefore mod of lambda must be less than 1. I took any arbitrary 
eigenvalue, I have shown that this is less than 1. Hence, I can say that the spectral radius of C must be less than 1. And that shows that Gauss-Jacobi method must converge. So that was the proof of Gauss-Jacobi method. And if you feel tired, then this is the second point where you should pause the video and take a little bit of rest. And also make sure that you worked out the puzzle that I asked you earlier, how to choose M and N carefully, such that the resulting splitting method is the Gauss-Seidel technique. Because we are going to give the answer to this puzzle in the start of the next part. So if you do not do it yourself, then you will miss the joy. The Gauss-Seidel method uses a different splitting than the Gauss-Jacobi method. So let's first understand what type of splitting Gauss-Seidel method uses. Suppose your original coefficient matrix is A. And I will take this example, <clears throat> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, just to keep it non-singular. I am not claiming that Gauss-Seidel method will converge here, but just to set up the Gauss-Seidel method, you can just write down the entire Gauss-Seidel scheme and you will find that it uses this splitting. It will take this part the lower triangular part including the diagonal as one half so 1 5 10 4 7 8 0 0 0 that is the m part and the remaining thing is the n part which is the strict upper triangular part 2 3 6 that will be the n part so it uses this M and N. So if I want to show that Gauss-Seidel method will converge, then I have to show that spectral radius of M inverse N for this M and this N will be less than 1. I am not claiming that for this particular example this will hold, but I am saying this is the condition that you have to check. Here is the condition under which Gauss-Seidel method is guaranteed to converge. It is a sufficient condition. The condition is that the coefficient matrix is positive definite. So it is a real symmetric matrix. Any positive, any positive definite matrix must be a symmetric matrix. And the extra condition that if the matrix is A, then x transpose ax is always strictly positive if x is non-zero. In fact, something stronger is true. If x is any complex vector, then x star ax must be a real number which is strictly positive if x is non-zero. If this condition holds, if A is a positive definite matrix, then the Gauss-Seidel method must converge. We will show this, that is, we shall so show that if this condition holds, if it is positive definite, then the spectral radius of M inverse N will be strictly less than 1. Here the coefficient matrix may be written as A equal to L plus D plus L transpose. That is because this is a symmetric matrix, positive definite, in particular it is symmetric. So if this part is L, naturally the upper triangular part will be L prime and this part is your D. We have already seen that this part this L and D put together, that plays the role of M and this plays the role of minus N. So, M minus N will be A and we are interested in checking 
spectral radius of C which is L plus D inverse into L prime minus of that you can safely ignore the minus because we are working with absolute values. So you can put minus here or you may not put minus here. This is what we have to check. So in other words, we will show that if you take any eigenvalue of this, its absolute value, its modulus must be strictly less than 1. Now this is not a very nice looking thing. So what we will do is we will massage it a little bit. So I will call this C and I will massage it a little bit such that this looks somewhat simpler. Eigenvalues of C I claim is same as eigenvalues of this matrix. So let us clearly understand what I am doing. I am <coughs> dividing each row by square root of this diagonal element. Similarly, dividing everything in the column by the same square root. Effectively, dividing this number by its square root twice, so this will now become 1. Similarly, for each row and column, and that is effectively this. Now, you might ask, how do I know I can divide by this? What happens if this becomes 0 or what happens if it is negative? In that case, I cannot take square root. Am I going into complex numbers here? The answer is no. You told me that this is a PD matrix. If it is a positive definite matrix, then all the diagonals must be strictly positive. So I can safely do that. This matrix is similar to our original matrix C. In the sense, you have pre-multiplied and post-multiplied by two matrices that are inverses of each other. If you have any matrix A, you pre-multiply by some P inverse and post-multiply by P. This is called similar to the original matrix A and they have the same set of eigenvalues. So working with eigenvalues of C is same as working with eigenvalues of this. This has the added advantage that all the diagonal entries are now 1. So it is basically saying without loss of generality you can consider the diagonals to be all one. That is just the linear algebraic way of saying that enough to work with this. So I will just give it a name, call it C1. Do a little bit of massaging. So it is d to the power minus half. Put that definition of C here. So it is L plus d inverse L prime d to the power half and I have a minus you might actually drop the minus right here because spectral radius of any matrix is same as spectral radius of its negative because we are working with absolute value here modulus <coughs> so it is this and this may be further manipulated T L plus T this and here I had this I will introduce here one d half and d minus half. So they basically cancel each other out. With this, <coughs> life would be simpler. Give it a name. So the entire thing is inverse of something. So you can think of it as these things entering. So the entire thing will be inverse of something. Inverse of what? So this d half will come on this side and become d minus half l plus t and d half. So what I am using is this. If you have a b whole inverse is b inverse a inverse. Okay? So have position. So d to the power half. If I go from here to here d to the power minus half will become this d to the power half. d to the power half here will become d to the power minus half there. And the rest of it, this is up to this. Now the rest of it, I will leave as it is. So this becomes d minus half l d half plus identity. d minus half on this side, d plus half on this side. So there will be identity inverse d l prime 
So I am getting this quantity twice, give it a name, call it L1. So it is minus I plus L1 inverse L1. So I basically simplified it. I basically said that D may be taken to be equal to identity. If you put D equal to identity, you get this. Without loss of generality, you can assume all the diagonal elements are 1. Then this will immediately reduce to that. That's all. So this argument basically shows that without loss of generality part. Now we will prove it for this special case. Okay, so let lambda be an eigenvalue of this. So lambda is an eigenvalue of this. Eigenvalue of this. We shall show that this lambda has to be strictly less than 1 in modulus. The argument that we shall be using will be pretty tricky. So you have taken one eigenvalue of C <coughs> or C1 rather with corresponding eigenvector X where X has non 1. These are all complex numbers and complex vectors in general that is equal to 1. So this means that we have C1x is equal to lambda x and that means i plus L1 inverse L1 prime x is equal to lambda x. Hmm. <clears throat> now what I shall do is this, I will take this on that side. So minus L1 prime x is equal to i plus L1 lambda here, it's a scalar x. Okay. <clears throat> so what I will do now is pre-multiply by x star from the left. <clears throat> so I will do take x star and multiply from that from left so it will become minus x star L1 prime x is equal to lambda x star. Lambda being a scalar is always coming out. 1 plus L1 x. So this is lambda x star x plus x Start L1 X. This we already know is 1, so that becomes 1. <coughs> so I get lambda 1 plus X1 star L1 X. Observe that I get this quantity in two different places. So naturally I will give it a name. Suppose I call it Z. Remember it's a scalar quantity, it's a complex number possibly. This is a row vector, a matrix and a column vector. So it's a scalar. The same z is here. <coughs> oh, not, not, not entirely. This, is, this has a prime and this does not have any prime. So I will call this z. If I call this z, you should observe that this is nothing but its complex conjugate. Let's understand why. This is z. That's a scalar quantity. So what is z bar? z bar, I can think of it as z star. Z star is complex conjugate and then transpose. Being a scalar, the transposition has got no effect. So this is X star L1 X whole star. <coughs> so things will switch. X will become X star and go on that side. That X star will become X and come on this side. L1 will become its star. L1 being a real matrix. Complex conjugation will have no effect on it, only the transposition will have effect. So it will have become L1 prime x. So this will be z bar. If this is z, that is z bar. And therefore we get minus z bar is equal to lambda into 1 plus z. Much simpler. So these tricks are all rather unmotivated. <coughs> so I will write lambda therefore as minus z bar divided by 1 plus z and <coughs> taking absolute values 
this will become mod of z divided 1 plus mod of z. <coughs> so I get this. This I can write as z minus 0 and z minus minus 1. So this is distance of z from 0, distance from z from minus 1. So if you consider the complex plane, here is your 0 and here is your minus 1 and here is your z set. So this distance divided by that distance. Now remember what we are trying to do. We are trying to show that this is less than 1. So I am going to show that this distance must be less than that distance. If I can show that, then I have achieved my A. Well, we have come to the near the end of the proof. We have just a little complex plane argument here. And we are going to use the fact that our coefficient matrix A was PT. Now remember that our original matrix was PT. And that was L plus D plus L prime. And we are actually working with D minus half here and D plus half here. So, D minus half A D plus half. That's the similarity transformation. So, if this is PD, so is this. This is our L1 plus identity plus L1 prime. So, this has to be a PD matrix. I have that information available to me. So, if I consider that X, AX star, then this L1 plus I plus L1 prime X, then that must be strictly positive. That is, by the definition of positive definite matrices. If I take a quadratic form with some complex vector, then I must get strictly positive result. Now, what is that? This is X star L1 X plus x star x plus x star l1 prime x this we know is 1 this is what we have called z and this is what we have called what we have seen is z bar that must be greater than 0 so z plus z bar plus 1 greater than 0 which means twice real part of z is greater than minus 1 or real part of z must be greater than minus half okay let's draw it in the complex plane real part of z equal to minus half this line minus half this is 0 this is minus 1 so my z must be on this half of the complex plane Observe that this is precisely the perpendicular bisector between 0 and minus 1. So if your z is here, then z must be closer to 0 than to minus 1. In other words, this must be less than this. So if you take the ratio, it must be less than 1. And that was precisely absolute value of lambda. So we have shown that for any Eigen value of C1, we must have mod lambda less than 1. So, spectral radius of C1 must be less than 1. Therefore, spectral radius of C, that same, must also be less than 1, completing the proof. Hmm. Ah, well, that was a pretty long proof. Finally, it's over. Thank God. Just remember that though the proof is long, the algorithm itself is pretty straightforward to apply. Now you might wonder, why is it that we prefer this algorithm to the Gauss-Jordan algorithm? Suppose we are trying to solve that uh, soap solution thing. Why is it that we should use this technique and not the Gauss-Jordan elimination technique? Well, there are at least two reasons. Reason number one, when the coefficient matrix is sparse, that is there are lots of zeros, 
then this Gauss Seidel or Gauss Jacobi technique becomes very simple. Because what do we do? In every row, that is every equation, we take part of the thing, that is typically the diagonal element, to the left hand side and keep the rest in the right hand side. Now if, as in our case, for the sub-solution case, every row has got at most six non-zero terms, you take one of them to the left and leave the remaining five in the right. So every equation basically consists of just six terms. So the matrix is a million by million, but you have only six things in each equation in gauss seidel or gauss jacobi So things may be done a lot faster. But if you are using gauss jordan elimination, in that case, even after a single sweep, many of the zeros will become non-zeros. In fact, almost all the zeros will become non-zeros. So you really have to carry out a million computations. So that is reason number one. Reason number two. <coughs> reason number two is that when you carry out Gauss-Jordan elimination, you might think that you are doing something exact. You have to carry out one million steps as your pivot marches down from the top left hand corner to the bottom right hand corner and after that you get the exact solution. That's not true. Because all the computational steps are implemented in a computer and so they are approximate. All these approximations will keep on accumulating. And it is quite natural when you do one million steps, all these little tiny errors will accumulate into a huge snowball. And the total error will be a lot more than you can possibly allow. In case of the iterative techniques, though you are using a lot of computation, still at every step you are merely doing this. You are applying it to the old values and getting the new values. And the moment the old values and the new values come pretty close together, you stop. What does that mean? This means whenever Ax is pretty close to zero, you stop. So you are not really relying on the accumulated effect of all the computations. At every step you are checking, is the current solution good enough? Is the current solution good enough? So you are doing only one set of computation to check if the current iterate is good enough or not. If not, you are updating it and then you again checking whether this is good enough or not. You are never relying on the accumulation of all sorts of all those million steps. At every step, you are doing a one step check. Is this good enough? If not, you move to the new value of the iterate. Again, you make a one step check. Is this good enough? So all the checks are based on single step. Think about this. You might initially be a little confused what I am trying to mean here. But the checking based, based on a single step, that is error is not allowed to accumulate. As a result, the solution obtained by the iterative methods in general are more accurate than the quote unquote exact solutions of the Gauss Jordan elimination. Okay, that's about it in this long lecture. So think about all these things and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them during our class session. Goodbye.